So on R11, the female reproductive system. So on the female reproductive system, we are first, first reminding you of the difference in the shape between a male and a female pelvis. There are many, many differences between the shape of a male and a female pelvis, but certainly one of the easiest ways to differentiate them is the pubic angle, formed by the pubic bones. If it's less than 90 degrees, it's a male pelvis. If it's greater than 90 degrees, it's a female pelvis. Now, this picture here is the genital area of the female. The genital area of the female is called the vulva. The vulva. Yes, you need to know that. So the genital area of the female is called the vulva. So looking at this, there's a structure right here called the clitoris. The clitoris. The clitoris is really the counterpart to the penis of a guy. In other words, just as the penis becomes engorged with blood and erect during sexual arousal in a guy, the clitoris, which is much smaller, becomes engorged with blood and erect during sexual arousal in a female. Now, of course, unlike the penis where sperm come out, it, uh, there's nothing that comes out the clitoris. But it, it is homologous, as we'll see in a moment. It is embryologically uh, derived from the same area that becomes the uh, penis in a guy, becomes the clitoris in the female. Now, attached to the clitoris are a, a, fold, a pair of uh, folds of skin. These are called the labia minora, the minor lips, the minor lips. And right between the minor lips are two openings, two openings. The more anterior upper opening is the urethral orifice. The urethral orifice is the opening for urine to come out. That's for urine to come out. Right below it, posterior, is the vaginal orifice. The vaginal orifice is for reproductive function. So we see that in females, there's a complete separation between the urinary system and the reproductive system. We have two separate openings, one for the urinary, one for the reproductive. In guys, there's one common opening. The urethral canal in a guy is not only for the urinary system, but it's also for the reproductive system. Urine comes out it, so does sperm. But in females, there's a complete separation. Incidentally, phylogenetically, based on evolutionary theory, that makes women more advanced than men. My wife told me to say that. <laughs> that, that, that. That would be true, because there's been a progression towards increasing separation of the systems. So anyhow. Uh, so this is the vaginal orifice, the vaginal opening of the vaginal canal or birth canal. This is for reproductive function. Here is the anus. So here we can see the proximity of all of these, and that's why we've said that wiping issues uh, become a source of possible urinary tract infections in women that don't happen in guys because a wiping in the anterior direction could take uh, a material from here, including E. coli bacteria, and introduce them around the urinary opening of the urethral orifice and lead to urinary tract infections. Again, the most common bacteria of urinary tract infections is E. coli. That is the most common. So uh, th this, uh, now, there, there's a, a kind of also a fleshy skin area right here called the labia majora, the uh, major lips. But these are really the folds of skin that, when spread apart, reveal the two openings in between. This uh, area, the area right between the vaginal orifice and the anus, is called the perineum, or perineal area. And where that becomes relevant, as we'll see in a moment, is that during childbirth, at least the, with the birth of the first baby, a procedure that we'll see written in just a moment called an episiotomy is performed where they make about a half inch cut downwards in the perineal area. Perineal means around the anus. They'll make a cut here to widen the opening of the vaginal orifice. That's only needed to be, needs to be done during the birth of the first baby. Uh, of course, when I ever mention that, 
Uh, it's a very sensitive area, so every woman is thinking, my gosh, that must be excruciatingly painful if they make a cut right there. But in fact, when they make it, when the obstetrician makes it, the women don't even feel it. You'd say, how could you not feel that? It's such a sensitive area. They do that cut when the head of the baby is crowning. It's right there, and it's stretching the opening. And all that a woman is aware of is she feels like she's about to burst because the head of the baby is coming out right there. So she's not aware of anything they're doing as far as making the opening a little bit wider. Of course, now women don't feel as much of this in general anyhow because they're under the influence of an epidural. But that didn't used to be the case. I've also mentioned the word hymen. Uh, the hymen is a, a thin, vascularized membrane that partially covers the opening of the vaginal orifice in girls. And the first time that this uh, vascularized membrane that partially covers the vaginal orifice, the first time it's broken in girls, so there's some bleed, a little bit of bleeding, a little bit of pain, uh, and that's the breaking of the hymen. And whether that occurs with the first sexual intercourse or it's possible that the hymen was broken because of just physical activity even before the uh, first sexual intercourse, that's uh, the breaking of the hymen. The, uh, we summarized over here on the left. So we've mentioned this, this area is called the vulva area. Uh, the mons pubis or mons veneris is literally the, where the pubic symphysis is and there's kind of a mound of of uh, fat right there. It's called the Mount of Venus, Mount Venus. Uh, we've, uh, we talk about the urogenital triangle right here and the anal triangle. That's what these terms are, urogenital and anal triangle. We mentioned the labia majora are the homologous or counterpart structures to the scrotal sacs of a guy. Uh, we've mentioned uh, the clitoris is homologous uh, the embryonic counterpart to the penis of uh, a guy. Uh, on R12, uh, on R12, so uh, in the uh, middle of the page on R12, so this is just showing embryologically the head of the penis and the head of the clitoris are embryologically the same, and the scrotal sacs and the labia majora are embryologically the same. So you could just see how they differentiate a little bit differently depending upon whether it's a girl baby or a boy baby. Up here, uh, here it shows the hymen. The hymen is that thin vascularized membrane that partially covers the opening of the vaginal orifice. Uh, and of course, uh, when, uh, when after a woman gives birth, so obviously the opening of the vaginal orifice is much wider after that time than it was before that time. The uh, vaginal canal or birth canal, uh, we wrote as a four inch long muscular tube. I never test on how long tubes are. It's lined by keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. Actually, to clarify, on the, towards the outside, it's keratinizing, and as one goes deeper in, it becomes non keratinizing. All right, so it changes from being like the kind of skin on the outer surface to the skin like on the inside of the mouth. It changes. Uh, the hymen is this vascularized membrane that's present in girls. In the inside of the vaginal canal are Bartholin's glands. Bartholin's glands secrete fluid for lubrication during sexual arousal in females. So during sexual arousal, when a woman gets wet in the vaginal canal, that's the Bartholin's glands that are secreting the lubricant, this fluid. They are homologous with Cowper's glands in a guy. So the Cowper's glands, which we had learned, secrete that sticky fluid at the beginning of sexual arousal in the urethral canal of a guy. Uh, there are Bartholin's glands that secrete a fluid in the vaginal canal, causing wetness during sexual arousal in a, in a female. One of the more common types of infections that occur in the vaginal canal of women are yeast infections. So uh, in guys like never get a yeast infection, but for women, they can get yeast infections in the vaginal canal. And it has to do with pH changes in the vaginal canal, which I'm not going to get into. Um, on page uh, R13, 
So the functions of the vaginal canal are intercourse, coitus, copulation. It all means the same thing. You know, the F word. The, uh, the, uh, it's all, so the functions of the vaginal canal are intercourse and childbirth. If a penis goes into the vaginal canal and no precautions are taken, it's possible that nine months later a baby comes out that vaginal canal. It's much easier to get the penis in than to get the baby out. All right? Easy in, not so easy out. All right? That's what's going on there. The episiotomy is a cutting of the perineum, the area between the vaginal canal and the anus. So here's the uh, urethral orifice. Here's the vaginal orifice. Here's the anus. This area between the a uh, vaginal orifice in the anus is called the perineum. That's this area right here. It means around the anus. And uh, an episiotomy is when they make a cut to widen the vaginal orifice to prevent tearing of the tissue during the birth of the baby. Again, it only needs to be done with the birth of the first baby. All right, so, uh, so much for the external genitalia. What about the internal? Let's look on R14. On R14, this is our picture of the female reproductive system on the inside. And notice I wrote no for final. I also asked you to know the picture of the inside, the internal uh, genitalia of a guy. Okay, pretty simple pictures. Just make sure you know them for the final. These are, the, of course, the ovaries. This is a cutaway view of the ovary. And you can see the egg popping out. That's called ovulation. We have an enlarged view that we'll look at in just a moment. Uh, these are the fallopian tubes. We've said in real life they're actually attached to the ovaries, but in this picture they were drawn, pulled away, uh, so that normally when an egg pops out, here, the way it's drawn, it looks like it would just fall down to the bottom of the floor, but in fact the fallopian tube's attached and it pops right into the fallopian tube. And then we know there are ciliated cells on the inside lining of the fallopian tube that begin pushing that egg uh, through the fallopian tube in the direction of the uterus or womb. And it takes about a week for the egg or an embryo, if the egg is fertilized, to uh, go from the beginning of the fallopian tube to the uterus. As far as the uterus, the upper part of the uterus is called the fundus, the middle part is called the body, and the bottom part is called the cervix. And uh, to me, that reminds me of the stomach a little bit because the upper part of the stomach was the fundus, the middle part of the stomach was the body, but the bottom part of the stomach, the last part was the pylorus. Okay, but here it's the cervix. The cervix of the uterus, which is incidentally one of the more common places where cancer can occur in women, cervical cancer, uh, it opens into the vagina or vaginal canal or birth canal. <clears throat> the wall of the uterus is made up of three layers. The inner lining is the endometrium, endo means inner, and that's where blood vessels grow. Uh, the thick middle layer is the myometrium, myo we, we know means muscle, that's visceral smooth muscle that can contract to push a baby out. So not only does it cause labor contractions, that's what's causing uterine cramping. Uh, then there's a, a simple squamous epithelial membrane on the outer surface called the parametrium, para means around. So that's just a simple squamous epithelial membrane. So that's the uh, kind of gross anatomy uh, of uh, the, the female reproductive system. Let's take a look at this enlarged picture of the ovary. And uh, in this enlarged view, cutaway view, the way that uh, the pituitary releases FSH and LH in women is it releases FSH for two weeks and then the pituitary gland switches and starts releasing LH for two weeks. Now this is very different than the, what the pituitary gland does in guys. In guys, the pituitary releases FSH and LH, both simultaneously, all the time. So we had said in guys on page uh, R2, just to remind you, on R2 we had said FSH causes the testes to make sperm, and LH causes the testes to secrete testosterone. 
So if FSH and, and LH from the pituitary gland are being released into the bloodstream and affecting a guy's testes all the time, then a guy's testes are making sperm all the time and producing testosterone, secreting testosterone, the male hormone, all the time. So that occurs throughout the entire life of a guy. So guys are always making sperm, they're always making testosterone. That begins when they're around 13 years of age and it continues to the day they die. The levels decline, they go down, the sperm count drops, the testosterone levels drops as they get older, but a 90-year-old guy could still, in theory, father a child, all right? Uh, but in women, FSH is going to be released for two weeks, and then LH will be released for two weeks. Then it switches back to FSH for two weeks. Because in women it keeps alternating or cycling, that's why they, this creates what's called the menstrual cycle, this alternating pattern. So what did we say here? We said FSH causes the growth of an ovarian follicle and causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen. What does that mean? So on our picture on page R14, FSH is going to be released for two weeks. And during that time, it's causing this ovarian follicle to grow larger. This is called an ovarian follicle. Okay, here's what it looks like. Inside the ovarian follicle is the egg. It is surrounded by follicle cells. So FSH, and what does FSH stand for? Follicle stimulating hormone. It's stimulating this ovarian follicle to grow. Usually in most women, each cycle, each month or each cycle, one ovarian follicle in one of a woman's two ovaries starts to grow. And so we think that the ovaries alternate, that if one cycle an ovarian follicle in her right ovary starts to grow, then the next month, the next cycle, uh, an ovarian follicle in her left ovary will start to grow. Now she starts out, when she's born, a little girl is born, she starts out with all the little tiny ovarian follicles she will ever have, which is more than enough, 400,000. You don't have to know that. And um, over the course of, her, uh, of, of uh, the reproductive uh, lifetime of a woman, of those 400,000 ovarian follicles or eggs, only about 400 of them will develop. You'd say, how come only 400? Because one develops each month. Well, that's 12 a year. And if she starts uh, ovulating or producing these ovarian follicles or eggs when she's 12 or 13 and stops by the time she's around 50, all right, so that's uh, it's about uh, 30 years, 33 years. Just multiply 30 times 12, and that's 360. So uh, that's uh, over 30 years. That's about 360. It's about 400 altogether. Uh, so uh, this ovarian follicle grows. FSH not only makes that ovarian follicle grow, it causes the follicle cells to do exactly what I wrote here, to secrete estrogen into the bloodstream. Now, of course, estrogen is the feminizing hormone that causes feminization. Now, that it takes the first two weeks. And then the next two weeks, LH is released. And the first thing that LH causes is ovulation. It causes the egg to pop out into the fallopian tube. So of course now, once the egg enters the fallopian tube, a woman could get pregnant. She can't get pregnant if the egg's still inside her ovary. And LH not only causes the egg to pop out and enter the fallopian tube, but it causes these cells, these follicle cells right here, to produce progesterone. Now let me explain. When you have this, uh, this structure here, with it, which is, contains an egg surrounded by follicle cells, is called an ovarian follicle. After the egg pops out, we still have follicle cells. We just don't have an egg inside it. This is called a corpus luteum. Corpus luteum is Latin for yellow body. That's not really helpful. That's just what they call it because it's slightly yellowish in color. But uh, uh, corpus means body, luteum is Latin for yellow. Okay, so it, it's not help, helpful, but that's what it's called. What is the corpus luteum? It's just the follicle cells. It's the name for the ovarian follicle after the egg pops out. The LH stimulates these follicle cells of the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. So you'll notice that FSH caused the follicle cells to secrete estrogen, 
But LH causes these very same follicle cells to secrete a different hormone, progesterone. In case you're wondering, like, how could it be that the same cells secrete different hormones? Because they have FSH and LH receptor sites. And when FSH activates the FSH receptor sites on these follicle cells, that causes them to secrete estrogen into the blood, bloodstream. But when LH activates the LH receptor sites on the same follicle cells, the follicle cells now secrete primarily progesterone. Now, in fact, they actually do secrete estrogen as well, but it's primarily progesterone. Progesterone, uh, uh, which we've spoken of back in section C, or page C11, you can look at it. The word literally means to prepare for pregnancy. Progest. Pro means to prepare. Gest, G-E-S-T, is the same root as the word gestation. Just if a woman, we talk about a nine-month gestation period of pregnancy. Gestation means pregnancy. Literally, it prepares a woman's body for pregnancy. In other words, the egg is popped out, and that egg might get fertilized. But the body doesn't want to wait to find out whether the egg is fertilized or not before it starts getting ready. It starts to get ready, whether or not that egg is going to get fertilized or not. Progesterone is secreted into the bloodstream, and one of the main things it does is it causes growth of blood vessels in the endometrial lining of the uterus. It is preparing the uterus for implantation. Now, of course, uh, if the egg is fertilized, the embryo will implant in the endometrial lining, and the blood vessels will nourish the baby, just as we learned back in section C. But what if the, uh, what if, uh, the egg isn't fertilized? What if a woman's not even sexually active? She's not even having intercourse? Then those blood vessels that grew will be shed. So the blood vessels that grew in the endometrial lining will be shed out the vaginal canal, and that's called having a period. That's called menstruation. So menstruation, or having a period, is the shedding of blood and mucus, of fluid, out uh, from the endometrial lining, out the vaginal canal, uh, and that happens if the woman didn't get pregnant. So every, uh, I, I read a, a book, a 19th century uh, book in physiology once, and they described a woman's period as the womb, her uterus, uh, crying because it didn't get pregnant. So a woman has a period if she didn't get pregnant. So in fact, if, uh, if a woman is sexually active and uh, uh, she goes through a whole cycle and she's not having a period, the most likely explanation of one is sexually active and you're not having a period is you're pregnant because then those blood vessels are not shed, they're nourishing the uh, embryo. Okay, now everything I've just described is written uh, in, in, our, in our notes. So let's go through this. So uh, right here, what are the functions of our, the ovaries? The ovaries have two functions, just like the testes have two functions. The first is oogenesis, the development of these primary or ovarian follicles. Uh, we wrote, this is stimulated by FSH from the pituitary gland. Normally, one primary follicle matures or develops each month. And to here, all, all that uh, we drew is a picture. You don't even have to draw it, the picture of an ovarian follicle. We had a picture right above. It's simply the egg surrounded by follicle cells. That's called an ovarian follicle. And I wrote that right here. Now, we've said that once the egg pops out, then we call it a corpus luteum. Okay, the name changes. Uh, the second function of the uh, ovaries, similar to the function uh, of uh, the testes in a guy, is to secrete hormones. And the hormones, both estrogen and progesterone hormones, are actually secreted. They are produced and secreted by those follicle cells. Right? And we said that the follicle cells secrete estrogen under the influence of FSH, but those same follicle cells secrete progesterone under the influence of LH. But it's the follicle cells that secrete these hormones. One of the things that I know is difficult for students is you've all, you've all heard, probably before you ever took this course, the ovaries produce estrogen. But we increasingly understand that everything is explained at the cellular level. 
So it's not really the ovaries that produce the estrogen, it's the follicle cells that are secreting the estrogen. Chemicals are produced by cells. And so it's, it's hard, but we have to get us, ourselves to kind of think a little bit more on occasion at the cellular level, because that's how we explain everything in modern biology and modern medicine, as I've said over and over in this course. So uh, the, uh, there are really many estrogenic hormones. There's not just one. I'm not asking you to know those names, uh, but they're collectively called estrogen, and they cause feminization. On uh, the next page are 15 at the top. So progesterone, which literally means before pregnancy or prepare for pregnancy, stimulates vascularization. You'd say, what's that? Exactly what I wrote. The growth of blood vessels in the endometrial lining. That's how you pr the, the body is preparing for possible pregnancy. Also raises a woman's body temperature by a degree. I'm not going to... We're not going to worry about that, but that, that becomes more important in physiology. Now, uh, what I wrote next is a little chart here that just shows us the comparable structures between males and females. So the counterpart to the testes uh, of a guy are the ovaries of the female. Uh, the counterpart to the penis of a guy is the clitoris of the female. We've seen, talked about that and seen pictures previously. The counterpart of the Cowper's glands in a guy are the Bartholin's glands in the woman. You might say, well, I don't even remember either one of those. Well, we talked about them. The Cowper's glands, we saw in our picture on R6, are these little pair of glands that secrete that sticky alkaline fluid at the very beginning of sexual arousal in a guy. And Bartholin's glands, which we described on page R12, on R12 we had mentioned they cause wetness in the vaginal canal at the beginning of sexual arousal in female on page R12. So those are the counterparts. And then uh, the counterpart of the scrotum in a guy are the labia majora in the female. Again, this was also shown on R12 previously. Here's this, what becomes the scrotum in the boy and what becomes the labia majora in the girl. These are known as homologous. Uh, structures, that means they are the of the same embryologic origin. The fallopian tubes or uterine tubes or oviducts are four inch long muscular tubes. As you know, I never ask how long, many inches it, it, long anything is. It's lined by a cilia mucous membrane. And fertilization, where a sperm unites with the egg, is in the fallopian tube. I mentioned next a tubal ligation sometimes called tying the tubes, all right? So the purpose of this is, to ster is a sterilization procedure to prevent pregnancy. It's really the counterpart to what a vasectomy was in a guy, which we spoke of previously. So just to help us visualize this, uh, again, if we look at uh, our picture on page R14. So on R14, just imagine if the fallopian tubes are cut, and tied off. What that does is that prevents the sperm, the sperm which are swimming up the uterus and into the fallopian tube, and the egg is going down the fallopian tube. If the fallopian tube's cut, then the sperm going up cannot meet the egg going down because it's been severed. So the whole idea was to prevent the sperm from uniting with the egg, all right, to prevent pregnancy. So that raises the same kind of similar questions that we posed with a vasectomy in a guy. One question is, well, do the ovaries still work? Yes, the ovaries still work. Nothing was done to the ovaries. The fallopian tubes were cut to prevent getting pregnant. So the ovaries still ovulate. The ovaries uh, still secrete estrogen and progesterone. Well, you'd say, okay, but if the egg can't go down the fallopian tube, what happens to it? The egg only lives a few days and then dies. Sperm live only a few weeks or a couple months, and they die. Red blood cells live 120 days, and they die. There are many cells in our body that only live a certain amount of time, and then they die. So if the egg can't move down, it doesn't matter whether the egg went to travel down and died here in the uterus, or whether it died here in the fallopian tube. It just disintegrates, and the chemicals are reabsorbed. Another question, very much like what, what we described after a vasectomy is, is it reversible? 
can you reconnect this if a woman changes her mind? And my answer is the same one I gave about whether a vasectomy is reversible. 80% of the time, 80% of the time when they try to reconnect it, it doesn't work. There's too much scar tissue because uh, the, uh, and because there's too much scar tissue, it just cannot be effectively rejoined together. So let's say they tried to rejoin it, it didn't work. So is there any way that a woman can still get pregnant? The answer is yes. They would have to remove the egg from her ovary and they would have to have the sperm unite with the egg in, by in vitro fertilization in a test tube. The sperm would unite with the egg, it would start to grow into an embryo, and then they would implant that embryo into her womb. All right, And so then she could carry the pregnancy then. So it's certainly still possible, but it's more convoluted, it's more complicated, and it's certainly more expensive. So, so menstruation will still continue? Menstruation still continues because that's controlled by these hormones, and the ovaries are still secreting hormones. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they, the, when you don't have menstruation is either uh, when the ovaries stop working, which is called menopause in women, or if the ovaries are removed from a woman for any reason. So if the ovaries are removed, then she doesn't have hormones anymore to, do, to produce these effects. Now, uh, now she, that she might take hormones uh, by medicine as a pill, but uh, that's the only way that you can still have these uh, hormonal effects is to re use replacement therapy. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, tubal ligation. On, back on R15, uh, the uterus, uh, as we've already described, is a muscular organ. What's really amazing is this is the size of the uterus in a woman who's not pregnant. I'm not testing you on it, I never ask sizes, but it's amazingly small. The uterus is only one and a half inches wide and three inches tall. I'm not testing you on that, but that's pretty small. And obviously, it stretches tremendously during pregnancy. So it really is much larger. We've already mentioned the upper part of the uterus is called the fundus. The middle part is called the body. The bottom is called the cervix. I'm not going to uh, go into the external os or vaginal fornix. Uh, so let's just move uh, forward. On, uh, on page R16, at the top of R16 is a term that I do want you to know. And that's what a pap smear is. What's really interesting is most every woman has heard that term pap smear, and most women don't know what it is. It is a test for cervical cancer. I'll tell you what, what most women think. They think incorrectly it's a test for sexually transmitted disease. It's not. It's not testing for whether you've got gonorrhea or syphilis or sexually transmitted disease it, or herpes. It's a test for cancer of the, the cervix. So you should know it. Now, how it got the name pap smear is it's short for Dr. Papanicolaou. Do Dr. Papanicolaou was a gynecologist who developed this method of gently scraping uh, the bottom of the cervix and scraping a few cells off the bottom of the cervix. And then they send that to a lab, and they look at those cells to see if they appear to be precancerous or cancerous. And that's what a pap smear is. So I would like you to know that. Uh, the histology of the uterus, we've already said, uh, the endometrium, of course, is where blood vessels develop. The thick myometrium is the muscular layer of visceral smooth muscle. And there's a hormone that we've talked about called oxytocin uh, that stimulates the contraction of the uh, myometrium uh, and therefore initiates childbirth, labor contractions. And then we've mentioned the parametrium the simple squamous epithelial membrane uh, on the outer surface of the uterus. What is a hysterectomy? Hystero is a Greek root meaning uterus. So hysterectomy is the uh, ectomy, is to cut out the cutting out of the uterus, the removal of the uterus. Now, why would the uterus be removed? There are many reasons. Certainly one would be cervical cancer. We know that any time any part of the body becomes cancerous, they remove that organ or structure. Uh, but there are other reasons why the uterus might have to be removed besides cancer. Now, uh, you can draw a line right here, as I have. Uh, I am not going into the menstrual cycle. That's really uh, not something we need to cover in anatomy, especially in the last class meeting before uh, of this semester. But it's um, certainly something you'll cover in physiology. But what I have done uh, in this picture on the, on the R14 is I've laid out for you 
the framework for the menstrual cycle. Because this whole cycle, as I've described, is called that because it involves alternating FSH and LH. So first you have this part of the cycle, then this part, then you repeat it. If you don't get pre if the woman does get pregnant, immediately begin a new ovarian follicle starts to grow. So this is this cyclic pattern. We're going to skip to page uh, R20. And on R20, anything I'm skipping, you don't have to know. You should recognize this picture. Because this same picture appeared in section C on embryology. The same picture. So here we're just reminded, here's the egg. It's been ovulated from the uh, ovary. And here a sperm is uniting with it. That's called fertilization. And uh, the, uh, when the sperm unites with the egg, that forms a zygote. And a zygote is the first body cell, somatic cell, of a new person, potential new person. Uh, that's a somatic cell. Remember, a, a, a sperm and an ovum are haploid sex cells. Incidentally, that's basic information I would expect you to know for a final. Uh, zygote will divide into a two-celled embryo. Those cells divide by mitosis into a four-celled embryo. It becomes a little ball of cells called a morula. And then it becomes a hollow ball called a blastocyst. And that's what implants into the endometrial line of your uterus. All this should seem familiar because we said exactly the same thing back in section C. At the uh, bottom, uh, we said it takes about one week after fertilization for implantation of the blastocyst. And then I want to remind you, uh, the, uh, as the embryo develops, the blastocyst develops, there is an inner and an outer membrane. The inner membrane is called an amnionic sac, and the outer is called the chorionic sac. And that chorionic sac, specifically the chorionic villi of that sac, start to secrete a hormone called chorionic gonadotropin. Now, everything I'm telling you right now is on page C11. It's, none of this is new information. This is all old information. Let's look on R21. So on R21, in this picture, here's the embryo. It is surrounded by an inner amnionic sac filled with fluid, amnionic fluid. This is the outer sac. They're called the chorionic sac. It actually developed from the outer wall of the blastocyst, the trophoblast layer. And on one side of the chorionic sac are these chorionic villi. That's called the chorionic villi or chorion frondosum. And this forms the fetal portion of the placenta, the fetal portion of the placenta. This was all covered uh, back in section uh, C. Now, we also know there's going to be blood vessels of the mother growing in here. That forms, uh, that's, th these blood vessels of the mother form the maternal portion of the placenta. And together, that allows the exchange of nutrients and waste products between the mother's bloodstream and the baby's bloodstream. These chorionic villi, though, have this other function of releasing a hormone. And this hormone is called chorionic anatotropin, and it, it, it's released from the chorionic villi and enters the mother's bloodstream. And as we learned back on C11, uh, this chorionic gonadotropin, it actually mimics the action of LH. You say, I don't even know what that means. LH, we said, stimulated the follicle cells of the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. That's what chorionic gonadotropin does as well. Chorionic gonadotropin, being produced by the embryo, also stimulates these follicle cells of the corpus luteum to continue to secrete progesterone. So if progesterone continues to be secreted from these cells inside the mother's ovaries, that's why she's not going to have a period through the, uh, during pregnancy. She will continue to maintain the endometrial lining and the blood vessels will continue to nourish that embryo for the duration of the pregnancy. You see, normally, if a woman doesn't get pregnant, uh, LH stops being released after two weeks from the pituitary gland. And when it stops being released, the corpus luteum stops secreting progesterone. And the drop in the progesterone hormone level causes the shedding of the endometrial lining. But in this case, progesterone continues to be secreted 
even though pituitary isn't releasing LH, the embryo is producing a hormone called chorionic gonadotropin that does the same thing as the pituitary hormone, LH. So uh, everything uh, I'm saying you have written on page C11, don't believe me, read it, you'll see it. And I've also written it right here uh, on R21. On R23, uh, just a couple of terms here uh, that I'm going to ask you to know. On R23, a term we learned way back in section B on cytology, menopause. And uh, menopause is the, occurs around the age of 50 in women. It's when the ovaries, the common expression is, become burned out. They stop working, and they stop responding to FSH or LH. And so that's the time when the woman's ovaries stop working. They stop ovulating. They stop secreting estrogen. So there's a drop in the estrogen hormone level. And a long time ago, we said that that drop in the estrogen hormone level leads to autolysis of the uterine cells and the uterus shrinks or atrophies. Also not new, because we just described it, I uh, put a little asterisk here and underline, cervical cancer, uh, the third most common type of cancer in women after skin cancer and breast cancer is uh, diagnosed using a pap smear. So we want you to know that. On page R24, on R24 at the top, I want you to know the word parturition. Parturition is the clinical word for childbirth. That's what clinically is the word they use. Now, uh, we have learned a long time ago, in, uh, towards the end of our embryology discussion, that most women carry their baby oriented horizontally for most of the pregnancy. Around the seventh month of pregnancy, the baby starts to rotate into the head down position. And I, I call that the blast off position. Uh, because the baby goes into the head down, so that the head will be born, come out first. That's called cephalic presentation. Cephalic means head. Head is presented first. If the baby fails to rotate into the head down or cephalic position, that's called breach. We say the baby is breech. And uh, if the baby is breech, meaning it's not head down, that's one of the reasons that today they will do a cesarean delivery. That's where they'll make an incision in the abdomen and through the wall of the uterus and bring the baby out through the abdomen, not rather than the baby being born out the birth canal or vaginal canal. So uh, there are other reasons why they would do it, but to, uh, in the old days, they used to yank on a foot or pull on an arm. They used to use clamps, and all they did was injure the baby. So today, they'll do a cesarean delivery. On R25, in the picture at the right, uh, we see what definitely looks like a pregnant woman. But you can see that as the baby grows larger and larger, and most of its growth occurs, especially the last two months, where it really gets bigger. Uh, so it's pushing against all the intestines. It's pushing against the, the rectum. It's pushing basically against the urinary bladder. So women can't, you know, they have to go more frequently because of the pressure of the baby against the uh, urinary bladder. And somehow at the time of birth, it's got to, the baby has to come out that vaginal canal. Now on R26, this is just showing on R26 the birth of the baby, kind of a cutaway side view. And when the head uh, reaches right at the opening of the vaginal canal or birth canal, that's called crowning. If you kind of look straight up, you can usually see the hair of the baby's head. And uh, the most difficult part of this birthing process is getting the head out, because the head is the biggest part of the baby. Once the head comes out, then everything else kind of slips out. You can see here, here's the umbilical cord attached to the placenta. And remember, part of that is the fetal portion, and part of it is the maternal portion, which is part of that endometrium. So they're connected. Uh, after the baby is born, they cut the umbilical cord, and we still have the rest of the umbilical cord attached to the placenta. The uterus contracts usually a few more times. The placenta tears away, and there is a lot of, you know, there is loss of blood and fluid, and this comes out the vaginal canal, and that's called the afterbirth, afterbirth. So that's the umbilical cord and the placenta that's discharged out. In the um, 
lower uh, photographs. So if you can kind of make out what's going on here, uh, in this particular photograph, the mother's kind of holding her thighs up. Here's the baby coming out. Notice that the way the baby is normally born, uh, the face of the baby is facing away from the mother. In other words, if she were to look down to see what's going on, she would see the back of the baby's head. It's not like she'd look down and the baby would be looking at her. Okay, so if, and the, the face is facing away from her. Here they've rotated the baby sideways and the baby slipping out on the lower left. In the lower left, this is actually the umbilical cord coming out the vaginal canal. And this is the baby. They're putting a clamp, a hemostat, and they clamp it. They will usually actually, before they clamp it, squeeze the umbilical cord, squeezing blood that's in the umbilical cord to the baby. And then they clamp it. And then um, they, uh, somebody's going to cut the umbilical cord. Usually it's cut about a half an inch, an inch away from the body. So it's still a little stump. <clears throat> now usually if a father's in the room, they'll say, Do you want to have the honor of cutting the umbilical cord? Uh, after they uh, clamp that umbilical cord, that ends the, all the free lunch. There's no more <laughs> free food. There's no more free oxygen. The kid's on his own. So the most difficult breath that you ever take is the first breath because your lung, the lungs are just filled with fluid. There's no air in them. So it's like, you know, when you inflate a balloon, the hardest time is to inflate it the first time. Once you've inflated it the first time, then you can let out the air, and it's much easier to reinflate it. So they, there's, because there's fluid in the lungs, they turn the baby upside down, and literally as it's taking its first breath and taking air in, fluid is coming out of its mouth and nose. So uh, that they, that's why they turn it upside down. And uh, what they really want to hear is a lot of good yelling and screaming, and that's what they want to hear, and they want to see a lot of kicking. Now, in fact, uh, you know, when we give you exams, you, this is it's school, uh, getting uh, tested and getting a grade didn't begin when you began school. It began with the day of your birth. On uh, R27, I'm not testing you on this. I am not. But there's, on the very moment of your birth, you were given a grade. It was called your APGAR score. It was named after Virginia APGAR, a pediatrician. And it's based on five criterion, uh, heart rate, respiratory effort, uh, muscle tone, reflex, irritability, and color. And the, uh, it's scored from, as you can see, uh, they can give a zero, a one, or a two for each of these three characteristics. So you can see uh, if the baby is, as far as color, looks blue, that's a zero. If they're pink, uh, kind of at least uh, pink on the uh, body, but the extremities are blue, that's a one. If they're totally pink, that's two. So a perfect score is five, one, two, three, four, five times two, or ten. Uh, you can be a perfect ten. Most babies, when they're first born, many mothers actually, if they see that, they almost think they're dead because they're not moving much and they may be blue. And so they usually score them, and most babies score around six or seven. Uh, the pediatrician rescores them about five or 10 minutes later, and by that time, most babies are nine or 10. So they initially look like they're not moving much, and they may be blue, and then within a few minutes, they start kicking more, they start turning all pink, they start screaming, and that's what they want to hear. And of course, why the kids screaming and yelling is, because there's no more free lunch. They're going to have to go and make their bed. They're going to have to go to school. They're going to have to help with the dishes. They're going to have to take the trash. Who needs it? You know, they had a nice life inside the womb. And now, all of a sudden, they got all the work begins. You know, who needs it? So no wonder they're crying. So um, anyhow, so that's the APGAR score. Now, at the very bottom of the page, I'll just mention briefly a cesarean section or C-section. This is when the baby is removed through an abdominal incision. Uh, I wrote about one out of every four babies is delivered today by cesarean. And in fact, in some places, like the west side of Los Angeles, in some hospitals, it's almost one out of three. <clears throat> now, some people criticize that they do it too frequently, C-sections. But there are some good reasons. Uh, one of the most common reasons is failure to progress in labor. So if they, in the old days, some women would be in labor for days. 
Uh, today, uh, if once a woman is admitted into the hospital and because she's in labor, if she doesn't deliver that baby within 12 hours or less, they're going to go and take the baby out. They're not going to have the woman sitting there in labor for several days. It was exhausting to the mother. It was stressful to the fetus. So they'll do a C-section. So on R28, uh, uh, we've already mentioned that breech presentation is another reason for doing a C-section. And I listed some others, but I'm not really going to explain them. So, um, well, one more, one last example that why they'll do a C-section, fetal distress. Uh, if the baby's heart rate starts to get real fast or real slow, that's called acceleration or deacceleration, that's called fetal distress. It's getting stressed. The heart rate is not steady. And so, again, in the old days, they would just let that go on and on and on. Today, that, they say, that's a re we're just going to go in and get that baby. Uh, I will say on the positive side of this, whatever the, one might say about negative, um, the, you know, 100 years ago, women would die during childbirth and babies would die during childbirth. Today, neither happens. So that I would say to that, to that extent, it's beneficial.